Our final session today uh, is from Rich Maltzman. Um, Rich is um, an expert on sustainability in projects, particularly he's going to talk about sustainability in project programs and portfolios. Um, so somebody sent me a really nice biography, most of which I'm not going to read because um, it if, if, if I do, then you know, we won't have time for his talk. But um, let me just put his slides up. And, uh, but Rich um, has been involved in project management and been involved in BU's project management program for a number of years. Uh, he's, um, he's an engineer and a project management uh, specialist. Um, he's focused on consulting, teaching. He's developed project management curricula. He's taught at several universities. He's currently uh, an adjunct professor here at BU on the BU uh, MET Project Management Program. Um, he, he's been involved in developing um, the PMBOK um, over the years. He's contributed to the fourth and the fifth uh, versions of the PMBOK. And as some of you probably know, um, the PMBOK is under development again at the moment, and I suspect he might well be involved in that as well. Um, he's written and presented papers all over the world for PMI, International Project Management Association. He's presented at conferences everywhere. Um, he has um, his undergrad degree from uh, Massachusetts Amherst. And he has a master's from Purdue, um, mini MBA from the Wharton School at Penn. Uh, he's, he's been involved with uh, the Kelly School of Business in Ireland and INSEAD. Um, he's done all sorts of stuff, um, some of which hopefully he might actually tell us about. Um, and he's also co-authored a number of books. The one that, we, that we're very much aware of um, is the book on green project management that was published in, I think, 2010 or 2011 that won the Project Management Book of the Year that year. I wrote that jointly with Dave Shirley, who's another adjunct, um, adjunct professor here at BU. So um, I'd like to welcome Rich to the podium to talk about sustainability in projects, programs, and portfolios. Thank you, Rich. Um, oh, oh, stole it. Bless you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, microphone, there we go. Hello. Okay, it's good to be here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I think I show up in the printed materials as coming from Benedictine University. That's a, a residue from teaching one class at uh, Shenyang University in uh, uh, China on behalf of Benedictine uh, last uh, summer. It was a great experience. So I'm here to talk to you. I'm here between you and lunch, so I realize that. Uh, so I won't be that sustainable. Uh, because that won't be a very sustainable uh, situation for your tummies. So uh, I'd like to talk with you about sustainability in projects. Um, really what I want to cover here is what sustainability really means. Does that have anything to do with me as a project manager? Um, I'll talk about what we called in our first book a rainbow of green, the fact that sustainability is not just about saving snails or um, efforts to build solar power plants. Uh, what it means, not just at the project level, but also at the program and portfolio level. Uh, we'll introduce uh, in our, our latest book, we actually have an assessment tool that can have you do a little bit of a health check on your project and your company to see how well sustainability is integrated into your project portfolio. Talk a bit about that. Really, this is about the triple bottom line meeting the triple constraint. Um, and along the way, I'll have some connections to the books, not advertising them, but just so that it's, it's referencing them. The books are shown up there. The first one was called Green Project Management. It did win the Cleland Award, which is the award for literature from PMI in 2011. The latest book um, is uh, driving um, su success in projects, programs, and portfolios. So we'll start off with this, and this connects very well with Professor Greenman's talk. Does anyone know what that is? What are we, what are we looking at? No, no, no. It's close to it, though. It's very close physically to it. The, the arrows are pointing to? The light, the light fixtures. That's right. In fact, those lines uh, also become important in this talk as well. So that's one of 25,110 pound light fixtures in the Big Dig, some of which started to fall. And luckily, this was detected before they started to fall on the roadway and caused uh, pr uh, problems with the actual drivers. It fell, the first one fell overnight. 
Um, it had a major impact in terms of a new project being launched, a rescue project, so to speak, about $54 million, lane closings and so forth. People were fired over this. And what it really came down to was galvanic corrosion amongst the brackets that held these fixtures to the, to the surface of the, of the tunnels. And um, the consideration for salt, for other chemicals, for cold and, and temperature changes uh, was a little bit too weak here. Now, this does not take away from the Big Dig project. I don't want to, you know, say anything about the Big Dig project overall. Still a fantastic collection of major projects and sub-projects. But we will come back to it a little bit later, and uh, we'll be a little bit critical of the Big Dig um, in terms of where it fits overall and things. But you'll also see how it fits uh, relative to other projects. So um, two key takeaways. Start with what you, I would like you to take away from the, the talk. Um, project sustainability is not always about green. We were actually forced by the publisher to use the word green project management. We wanted to call it other things. They felt that green would be a very important uh, aspect in terms of selling the book. So they, they really wanted us to call it green project management. Um, so one takeaway is that project uh, sustainability is not always about green. It has to do with the triple bottom line, and I'll go through that in a moment. And the other thing is it's about long-term thinking. It's about considering through the end of your project to the operation. And Virginia, uh, Dr. Greenman, talked about that, and I'm really glad that she did. She said you'll have to think through what this project's benefit means in the longer term and not just turning it over on a certain date. And that's quite true with the big dig. So I love this chart. It comes from Stanford University. I got permission from Stanford to use it. It comes from something they call the Stanford Execution Framework, which is the basis for their whole um, certification program in advanced project management. Um, what I like about the chart, and I won't go through the whole thing, is it goes from the company's purpose, the, you know, the, the Steve Jobs, if you've seen his movies, the purposefulness of a, of a leader establishing what we're all about as a company. That whole top oval is called ideation. Think about mission, vision, and values. And then down at the bottom, the uh, purple oval is really, if you'll remember this commercial, time to make the donuts. Do you remember that commercial? Time to make the donuts. Operations, day to day, you know, handover to the, the way things are in a factory or an accounting department uh, or tr uh, cars and traffic uh, going over the big dig. But the connection point from all that stuff at the top, the so called rubber, um, to the road, meaning the donuts is projects, programs, and portfolios in this model. There's a single touch point between strategy and portfolio there. If that breaks, there's no connection between uh, the company's mission statement and what it's all about and what happens on the floor of the factory or what happens on the highway surface. In fact, you'll see a disconnect right there uh, in an example that I'll use from Volkswagen that most of you are familiar with. So we sit right there where the rubber hits the road, and that's what a lot of our writing is about. And that's what makes me still get excited about project management and still want to teach here at BU um, because it's a great discipline. We are where the rubber hits the road. Stuff doesn't get done without us. So let's back up and talk about sustainability. It, the word is thrown around a lot. What does it mean? Uh, there's a Bruntland definition, which I won't even read aloud, partially so you can get to lunch but partially because most of you have seen this definition. I like the definition from uh, um, Auden Schindler from a book called Getting Green Done, and it speaks very much to art's philosophy of keeping things simple. It's basically about thinking as if you're in business forever, which means you're responsible for the outcome, the steady state byproducts of whatever it is that you're making, and you're thinking about that as you design your products and services. And so just that nice, simple definition takes a complex definition and brings it home. Thinking as if you're in business forever is a great way to think about sustainability. A great read, by the way. All right. So sustainability, I'll just animate this more quickly, is about social, environmental, and economic bottom lines, what your project means in terms of money, in terms of people, and in terms of the planet. Okay. And if you look at the intersections here in this Venn diagram, you can get some pretty interesting combinations. But what it comes down to is that sustainability is at the intersection of all three. It means we've thought about people, planet, and profits. Okay. So when we took that aspect and tried to combine it with project management, what we found is that there's a, a rainbow of projects along, that, along a spectrum 
from projects that are green by definition. You're doing a species rescue project. You're building a solar power plant. Uh, these are green by definition. And so I represent that with a windmill. Okay. Um, as we move to the right here, the projects aren't as obviously sustainability oriented. So you might have a, a, a large construction project. That's green by project impact. The Big Dig would be an example. Anytime you're, you're digging into the ground or scraping the earth, um, the project itself has some kind of an impact. Then you have green by product impact. I have a coffee cup there, and I'll explain why later. It's not just to make you hungry and thirsty. And then on the right-hand side, you have the projects that are least obviously sustainable. Um, and that might be the introduction of a new software package. What I've shown on the bottom is that the focus on sustainability is very high if the project is green by definition. It's less obvious as you move to the right, and the role of the project manager to, to ask those kinds of questions about sustainability goes up. What about this? What about that? You have to be the change agent, the little irritant, if you will, that's asking questions like, is there a better way to do this for what happens after we turn the project over? So here's some examples. Um, also referring to Art's talk, this is another great triumvirate project. This is a project called EcoCar, and we're lucky enough to work on this. Uh, EcoCar is a project that is green by definition. What is it? Anyone heard of it, by the way? EcoCar? No one. Our government does a lousy job of promoting something when they do it right. <laughs> this is the Department of Energy. Uh, Argonne National Labs is the program manager for it. Uh, General Motors and 16 universities across the country. And in this program, the students at these universities, about anywhere between 10 and 40 students, in the case of Ohio State, which tends to win this uh, competition, it's about 40 people. Uh, they receive a, a 2016 Chevy Camaro for free. Um, they will take it apart completely down to the nut and bolt and reassemble it as a hybrid or an electric car. That's the challenge. They have four years to do this. Um, General Motors gets the patents that come out of this, so they, they win. Uh, the government sees tremendous improvements uh, because they did this with the Malibu prior to this. They see tremendous improvements in mileage and innovation, and uh, the schools get uh, $150,000 per year, the winning school each year each, is a different category each year. Uh, look it up, ecocar3.org, fantastic organization, um, great triumvirate effort, and we actually train the project managers. Each of these teams are made up of mostly mechanical, electrical, and um, chemical engineers. And you can imagine if you gave a, a garage and put 40 mechanical engineers and other engineers in the room and say, go for it, just going to be nuts and bolts flying everywhere. So they've realized these are projects, and each of these teams has a project manager, and we uh, luck luckily assist them in training the project managers for the teams. But that's a green by definition project. Its focus is to try to improve the um, mileage, the fuel efficiency of um, a General Motors car. Uh, Desert Tech is another example. I won't go through the details, but obviously a large solar project like that would be another example of green by definition project. All right, the big dig. This is green by project impact. So however you look at it, there are a lot of stakeholders involved in the big dig. Um, people who live nearby, people who travel over the big dig tunnel, uh, through the big dig tunnels. Um, any of these projects, a new oil rig, the, there's impact from the project itself. So that's a little further to the right on that spectrum. The next one, and here's where the coffee cup comes in, would be green by product impact. In other words, the long-term um, outcome from whatever it is that the project does. So there is a project to launch a coffee maker, the Keurig coffee maker as, as an example. Um, and in steady state use, that coffee maker, um, it makes a great cup of coffee, but it also produces something else. It produces billions of these K-cups in the case of the Keurig. Those K-cups are not recyclable, or at least when they first came out, were not recyclable. There's enough of them to go from here to the moon and back and they're in landfills all over the place. Um, so the ongoing byproduct of this is uh, kind of a non-sustainable effort. And this is coming from a company whose parent is Green Mountain Coffee. So, and Green Mountain Coffee has a lot of mission statements about being friendly to the earth and fair trade, and they are. And in fact, they had to do some interesting um, 
rewording on their web page to talk about this. But they, they've made some changes here as well. All right. Um, let's move all the way to the right. And a lot of you I saw raised your hands when uh, Virginia asked about uh, who's an engineer. So a lot of you, like myself by training, are also engineers. So we think about ourselves as software developers or new product developers. And we don't see a connection to sustainability. I'm writing new code. What does that mean? Well, I'd like to introduce you to something called Green Touch. This was a consortium of telecom companies. Anyone heard of this? It's amazing. <laughs> so Green Touch was a collection of competitors and customers like, uh, at the time, um, Alcatel-Lucent and uh, Huawei Technologies, which compete vigorously on the market, but were partners in this effort. And their goal was to try to reduce the amount of energy used by the telecom network and by IT in general. All right. So um, this is way too many words on the slide. I just want to focus on the fact that Green Touch was, was trying to reduce by factors of uh, 20 the amount of energy used by telecom. Uh, one particular effort of interest was this thing called uh, bit interleaved passive optical networking. Obviously don't want to go into the details there but it has an amazing and astounding result. In fact, if you think about the telecom network, it uses as much energy as a whole bunch of New York cities. So keep that in mind, and now think about this. If you were to change the way that optical amplifiers work, and every time you watch a movie on Netflix, it's coming to you via fiber optic cable often, and there are optical amplifiers turning on and off. If you could change how that works, and change the number of transitions from on to off, just that change was enough to cause a 30 times reduction in power consumption just by changing a protocol. Okay, so here's IT doing a project, um, or a project that actually reduces power significantly. It's not a save the whales type of a project, but it has a significant impact. In fact, it took the equivalent cars off the road to remove all the cars from San Francisco's streets forever. Um, just that change in IT. So there are some amazing changes that can be done in so-called uh, green in general, in the green in general area. There's a great video on this if you want to watch uh, this. I've put the link in the presentation. Okay, let's go back to project management. As uh, mentioned, I got involved in the PMBOK guide, so I know a little bit about the uh, different chapters. One of the chapters, chapter eight, talks about quality. And what we did, Dave and I, when we wrote Green Project Management, was to realize that um, quality and sustainability actually have a lot in common. So, and we also realized there was no really good word to talk about greenness or sustainableness. So we sort of smashed the words together. And we said, well, green is about focusing on sustainability, reducing project, uh, product waste, uh, thinking about the life cycle of a project's product, not just the project itself. Quality is focusing on meeting customer requirements, reducing project waste, things like Six Sigma, and the customer supplier model. So we think of those things and we smash them together and we came up with this word, granality, uh, which describes both and we introduced that in the, in the book. And if you think about quality, you think about the cost of quality. This is on the exam, so pay attention. <laughs> cost of quality breaks down into the cost of poor quality and the cost of good quality, which means if you put work into um, your projects and put work into quality, things like appraisals and tests and certification, good planning, um, then you end up avoiding some of the costs of poor quality. This comes from the work of uh, Philip Crosby and his book, um, Quality is Free. It's the same for greenality. In fact, we can think about an example here that was quite striking. Most of us think about it as the Deepwater Horizon incident. That was the name of the platform owned by Transocean. Um, this was, actually was BP's well. BP, British Petroleum, owns the hole in the, in the ocean, and uh, Transocean owns the platform from which they drill. So we'll remember this, uh, this fire, and, and just as uh, Virginia did, I, you know, there were 11 people killed in this incident as well. Let's not forget that. So if you weigh the cost of good granality and the cost of poor granality here, you'll find some interesting things. Um, the investment in good granality would be testing and planning uh, data analysis, better familiarity with the Gulf itself. Um, it turns out that BP lifted the Exxon Valdez plan, so they had detailed plans for how to deal with walruses and rescue walruses from the Gulf. 
There's no walruses in the Gulf of Mexico, zero. But they had detailed plans because they actually had just copied and pasted the Exxon sustainability plan, okay? They could have spent some money there, and we think that it's uh, in the range of $20 million. And then if you look at the cost of poor granality and what happened in terms of the, uh, the blowout and the fires and so forth, you end up with the cost of poor granality, lawsuits, cleanup costs, the loss of the oil, jail terms, a lot of people losing their jobs, loss of brand reputation. There were second effects uh, because when you do risk response, there's also secondary risks, and in this case they used cleanup chemicals, which themselves were questionable in some, some ways. So all kinds of problems. And if you look at the money here, um, it's probably more like $60 billion. Um, the purely monetary loss, measurable monetary loss, was, well, I'll say $42 billion. So in terms of a scale, we're talking about 0.048%, the investment in good granality would have been just a fraction of a fraction of a percent. So as far as the scale is go going, it's off the scale, the scale breaks. It would have made sense to do some of the other tests. I won't go into details, but there were some specific tests that could have been done that were not done that could have led to um, discovering the problem a little bit earlier. Um, so one way that I uh, investigated this a little bit further was to look at BP's actual risk registers that ma they made available to their project managers. This is their template. This is the actual template, and a lot of this became publicly available because of the investigation by the Bureau of Energy Management. And it shows under the types of risks, we have cost, schedule, and production risks, but also on the, on the left-hand side here, do I have a pointer? No, I have a pointer. Uh, we have a lot of environmental uh, risks and safety risks listed. So BP has told their project managers, consider these things. That's the corporate template, okay? Here's the actual risk register, and if you click here, you'll see a drop-down box, which lets them choose the risks that they'll actually apply for this project. Well, in their actual project, they only included production schedule and um, cost. That's it. They didn't even, it wasn't even in the drop-down box. Safety and, uh, and environmental concerns weren't even listed, and there were zero identified. So an example of how a corporate effort didn't, did not filter well down to the actual feet on the street or on the platform. None of those were listed. Okay, so if you remember that model I showed you earlier from Stanford, we applied it this way as gears. We think of the rubber meeting the road just as before, but with portfolios of programs and projects as the connection point, as the cog that takes the mission statement and makes it actually work in terms of steady state operations. Given that we are there, um, we use that as the, ma uh, the main focus of our book. Okay, and there's a lot of studies that have been shown, including some from our uh, local area here, MIT and uh, Boston, uh, Cambridge, and uh, working with um, Boston Consulting Group, came up with uh, this report that shows that it's, it's catching on, that organizations at the higher level, at the um, mission and vision level are catching on to this. They see the advantage of pushing sustainability, if for no other reason as a brand reputation uh, effort, but also as an innovation driver, it fits into the corporate culture. Is it getting to us, the project managers? Probably not. Um, in fact, I can tell you that when we start to push for this effort amongst project managers, we sometimes get uh, pushed back. They're saying we already have time, scope, cost, and now you're giving us another headache, another constraint to work with. Go away. <laughs> Seriously, we have mail like that. Um, so at the very high level, at the corporate level, your leaders are thinking about this, all right? And I won't go into all the details given the time, all right? Um, the effort to convey this to the rest of the company is also something you could consider a project. So project managers have opportunities to get involved here uh, from multiple aspects, uh, including just the aspect of bringing this corporate culture to the day-to-day -day operations. A colleague of mine from the Netherlands, uh, Hilbert Silvius, um, created this drawing, and if you look at it carefully, and I'll have you do that as homework, it actually is very similar to the Stanford uh, model. 
And he's basically saying that at the very top, you have goal setting and performance evaluation. Then in the center, this connecting point, you have us, project management. And then at the top, you have the donuts, time to make the donuts, standard operation. And once again, we are that connection point. So where does this come together for us? How do we think about this as project managers? Well, we have to take a step back and learn a little bit about life cycle thinking. Any of you are familiar with LCA? LCA, life cycle analysis, the life cycle thinking. Um, I mentioned Hilbert Sylvius, and you may have heard the guttural in the ch there. That's because I lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years, and I got pretty good at uh, saying words like Scheveningen. <laughs> um, so one of the books that I read when I was in the Netherlands is called the, the Discovery of Heaven. Great book. If you're into science fiction, religious fantasy, it's fantastic. Um, but what I want to talk about is not the book, it's Table of Contents. Its Table of Contents is here. The beginning of the beginning, the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end, and the end of the end. Those are his four sections. Now, why do I put that up there? Because as project managers, we tend to think this way. We think of our projects as launching something and then handing it off, and then what do we want to do? What do we want to do? Next project, right? Next project. That's what we want to do. So we stop our thinking. We stop necessarily sometimes at that point, at the, what I call the end of the beginning, what he called the end of the beginning, and I think of as the project handover to operations. We would like to give you encouragement to think through all the way to the beginning of the end, and even, heaven forbid, the, the, um, the disposal of your project, uh, whatever art artifacts it has and how they're made to be reused or, or put back into, uh, into other use. Uh, think all the way through, and now you might not make some mistakes like um, how long a, um, uh, whether or not, for example, you have a non-recyclable outcome uh, as a byproduct. So here's a little question for you. In your home, you have two boxes, probably, or apartment, or you go to a place and, and use these boxes. They're about one meter by one meter by one meter. They used to always be white, but now they come in multiple colors. Um, what do you think I'm talking about? Uh, no, there's two of them. One sits next to each other. They have kind of opposite functions. It involves clothing, your washer and dryer. So here's an example of a washer and dryer. In fact, this is a washing machine, and what you see here is the impact on the environment amongst a bunch of things like energy consumption, air pollution, and so forth for that washing machine. What's striking about it is that the production of the washing machine, the distribution of the washing machine, and the disposal of the washing machine pale in comparison to your use of the washing machine in terms of impact. Because, for example, you're running a lot of hot water and electricity day to day to day to, um, to use that washing machine. So a company like Seventh Generation Anyone heard of them? Who makes um, uh, laundry detergents and so forth, was looking at thinning the walls of their plastic containers, changing the trucking routes uh, of shipping their detergent projects. All very good sustainably oriented things. But when they did a life cycle analysis on the actual use of their products, they shifted to trying to produce, for example, detergents that would wash in colder water. Because that would have a much bigger impact than just changing the thickness of the plastic on, the, on their, their products. So an LCA analysis shows you these kinds of things. It makes them clear as day. Uh, won't go into details. There is a, a, a ISO standard on this, ISO 14000. There are several companies, some even in the Boston area, like Sustainable Minds. Anyone heard of Sustainable Minds? Good company right here in Boston or Cambridge that writes software that does this for you. You enter into this software, all the attributes of the product or service that you, on which you're working, and then you do what-if analysis as to what might change overall impact. And if, for example, Keurig had done this, they would have seen that the recyclability <laughs> of their uh, K-cups would have had a huge impact on the actual overall impact of the coffee maker. So as project managers, our dilemma is that we'd love to look beyond we tend to want to think this way, but the necessities of life say, no, we've got a date, we've got an end date to meet, and we, we, we're going we're to focus our thinking on that end date. In fact, you can think of yourselves as looking at your project. Here's your Gantt chart, and that blue area is your overall project view. And there's behind you is the celebration about to happen when you turn this over to operations. And our thinking about operations is that little green square 
like, okay, it's handed off to operations, time to make the donuts, we want, we're on to our next project. So our projects, our project managers tend to be standing back to the wall in terms of operations. My message to you is at least think, at least spend some of your time taking that green, little green square and making that part of your thinking and squish the whole project back down here on the left and change your view from back against the wall to looking out to the longer term when you're making project decisions. I'm not saying that you have to be responsible for the long term 15 year life of your project. Just think about how that project, project's outcome is going to have impact on social, environmental and economic uh, uh, term in those terms for the longer term. Um, a colleague of mine, Ricardo Vargas, who's uh, known some, uh, by one of the top podcasts, the Five Minute Podcast, fantastic uh, uh, project management uh, podcast that he runs with a very strong Brazilian accent, but it's still worth listening to. It's also in Portuguese. Um, he uh, uses this little graphic to describe the difference between project, program, and portfolio management. We've been reaching out to project managers. Okay. But perhaps we've been reaching out to the wrong people. These are actual unretouched photographs of project managers' reactions, as I mentioned, when we say, you should be thinking long term. <laughs> now, they're not actual. Well, some of them are project managers. But this is the kind of look we get, right? Really? Do I have to think about that? So we think we may have been talking to the wrong people. Project managers should be getting this message, but they're closer to the ground. They're working on projects where they're really under pressure. Maybe we should be talking to the portfolio and program managers. And this image is just meant to show the overall structure of projects, that projects are made up of programs and portfolios, and maybe we should be talking more at the portfolio level because they're closer to that mission statement. Speaking of the mission statement, here's Volkswagen. Okay, Volkswagen had a tribal project, going more props to art here, where an organization, a small organization in the company, kind of in an us and them type thing, us against the EPA, said we can beat these guys, we can fool the EPA. We can put a system in with just a little bit of software that lets the uh, car pass the exam because it's stationary and turns off the emission controls when the car is on the road. Uh, it turns out that the West Virginia University lab some of the students in that lab are actually in the EcoCar program because West Virginia is one of the participants in the EcoCar, and they were they were not allowed to talk about it until the press uh, made it public. Anyway, think about that project, the project to write that code that changed the way the car works to basically fool the EPA. Do you think that project was aligned with the mission of Volkswagen? In fact, I'll jump ahead. You can see the results, right? Obviously, we had people fired. Their stock went down significantly. Here's the mission statement from Volkswagen, and I'm going to highlight one particular piece. It says, we'll be a leader in environmentally friendly projects, <laughs> but even more important, uh, yeah, it says, we will conduct ourselves in business activities on a responsible and long-term basis and not seek short-term success. Wouldn't you think that that software is seeking short-term success, right? So the, the mindset that allowed those engineers to work on that software and to get it through, and I'm not talking about, I don't want to get into the controversy of how it got through, but the fact that they thought that way tells me that the sustainability message did not get down to project engineers and certainly not to those people who actually wrote that code, right? They were not looking at the connection to the company's statement. If you think about that pyramid, they were not thinking about the corporate mission statement. Uh, so a lot was at stake here. Volkswagen lost a lot of brand reputation. They lost a lot of business. They're now trying to recover from that, and I, I hope that I hope they I hope they do recover. Um, so I'd like to, in line with that, issue the three-click challenge. This is in our latest book. Some of you may remember a movie, like this. So there was a movie, uh, The Wizard of Oz, in which Dorothy is told what? How does she get home? Just what? Click your heels three times and say there's no place like home. Well, there's a connection there because we're talking about clicking three times from the home page of a website to get to your organization's mission statement. So I wonder if you want to check this uh, out yourself. So here's Patagonia. Can you click three times and get to a message that says here is our commitment to sustainability in three clicks? Easy on Patagonia's site. You click on Inside Patagonia, 
Patagonia, you click on environmental and social responsibility, and then you click on becoming a responsible company and lots of detail about what they do in terms of uh, invigorating sustainable efforts and making it part of the co uh, corporate culture. All right, so the question I have for you is how would Dorothy do it? Your organization's website. Okay, so three clicks and there's no place like home. All right, this has come up in a bunch of places. This is not a brand new idea. This actually comes from a PM Journal article from 2012 in which they wrote about project success, product success, and organizational success. Uh, they didn't mention any green benefits and we think they fell a little bit short, but the message was very much like Dr. Griman ended with, that you should be thinking through to the long-term benefit realization of your project and not just finishing it on time. So we think they had left this, if they just went a little bit further in this article, they would have got to what we would call nirvana and they would have talked about sustainability success, kind of a triple bottom line oriented success. Uh, others today have uh, mentioned uh, Dr. Jeffrey Pinto, and so here's a, a quote from him. This is from 1988. So first of all, it starts with 19, so you know it's old. And then we're going back 12 years uh, beyond that. Interesting statement here from Dr. Pinto and a colleague. He says, there are definite benefits involved in waiting until after the project has been transferred to the clients for whom it's intended before assessing project success, right? Uh, some of you, this is off, it's off my normal script here, but some of you have seen pictures of the Flint administrators toasting uh, the water from Flint at, when they switched over to the Flint River from the Detroit River, declaring that a success, okay? So it's an example perhaps of declaring success a little bit too early, all right? Um, we basically are trying to say that project success is bigger than project management success. You can run a project very, very efficiently and you can claim that you did the project with a minimum of waste and you're on time, you're within scope, and you're under budget, that doesn't necessarily mean project success. Project success, as uh, Virginia said, means that the project yields benefits for a long time. So we actually have, a, of course, the obligatory two by two matrix. And in this one, um, we show project management success, in other words, how well the project was run. And on the, on the uh, vertical axis, Project success, how effective was the project in terms of translating benefits to reality? Now we can argue about whether the big dig really belongs in the lower left-hand quadrant, but um, on, on that side, you're looking at a project that has had relatively low um, uh, efficiency in terms of the way the project was run. And here I'm going after the longer, the bigger issues that uh, Dr. Griman also mentioned, things like the over, being over budget and, and late. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we have the Sydney Opera House. Has anyone been? Fantastic, fantastic building, right? Most people think of it as a success, right? It's a symbol of Australia. It's a beautiful place, and I was lucky enough to actually see um, uh, an opera there myself. Um, most people think of it as a success, and in fact, it is now. And maybe the Big Dig will elevate there as well over time, but during the construction of the, the Sydney Opera House, it was a disaster. I mean, it was an ad. Look it up. It was worse than the big dig in terms of being over budget and late and so forth. Um, but it has a long-term success. I mean, it's, it's on postcards. <laughs> so uh, it's typically considered a success. Uh, over here, we have projects where the product itself may have not succeeded, but maybe the project was actually managed pretty well. Right? And up here are your projects after watching this talk. These are projects that are going to have long-term success because you've thought through to the end and they're, because you're great project managers, are going to be managed effectively, uh, very efficiently, I should say, and on time, within budget, and meeting all scope. So our thinking is not only to take into account both effectiveness and efficiency, but also endurance. So think about how that project plays out when its steady state product is being produced year after year after year. Okay. Um, this is a chart coming from a, a gentleman named Bannerman, um, which we used in our book as well. It basically talks, it pulls together some of the thoughts we already have, in, but it frames them in terms of maturity. So here we're talking about project level thinking, product level thinking, and then thinking all the way through to what does this do for our company? Right. So even the Volkswagen engineers who wrote that code, what was the real benefit to Volkswagen? 
right? Was it providing a, an organizational benefit to Volkswagen? Maybe in the very short term. But did they not think they would eventually be caught? Almost everyone who's tried to do that, and by the way, all the auto companies have done that one way or the other. Going back to the first times that uh, there were tests done on emissions, uh, I think it was Ford had a, a little, literally had a switch on their hood. So if you lifted the hood to put the probe in the, in the, um, in the carburetor for the test, it would turn on the emission system. When you close the hood, the emission system would turn off. So they didn't use any software. They simply used a switch. So it, Volkswagen is not the only ones who have tried to do that. Anytime, however, you're trying to do that, you are not really thinking about the overall organizational benefit. You're looking for a small technical win. And I've talked to automotive engineers, and what they tell me is it turns into a us versus them tribal conflict. And this group of engineers says, we'll show that EPA. We can, we can overcome this restriction like it's a contest between those two organizations and not something that's true to what the company says they do. All right, so that's the thinking we're trying to promote. All right, um, change management. This is a real quick piece I'll try to do for you. Um, Art mentioned change management. There's a very good book on this uh, subject by Dr. Barbara Troutline. Anyone ever seen her talk? She gives a great talk at the PMI conferences. She wrote a book called Change Intelligence, where she measures something called change quotient. And the way I look at this is very simple. Uh, she uses the model of hand, heart, and head. And so I went with a hands model because most project managers, when they take this intelligence test, they turn out to be hands people because we're doers. All right, we don't think, we don't feel, we just do. <laughs> um, I'm exaggerating for effect. But if you look at a project, and I will not go through this in detail, this is in the, you know, the process group model. Um, there are roadblocks to our thinking long term. For example, we don't always have visibility to that mission, vision, and values. How many people, when they launch a project, seek to connect it to the mission, vision, and values of the company? I assert it's not a bad idea just to check that out and see what the company is saying at the high level, right? Then we go through our initiate, plan, execute, monitor, control, and then there's other roadblocks. For example, how do we measure success? Are we thinking about how the project's success is measured in the longer term, or do we only think about handing this off, meeting our project uh, KPIs, and then getting on to our next project, getting promoted maybe, and getting on to our next project, okay? And there's also maybe a roadblock between our closure and thinking about what happens when we hand this off uh, in terms of product waste, what happens in terms of the day-to-day uh, -day byproducts of whatever it is that we're producing. So I've worked with Barbara, and we've come up with this model to think about how this, her book, inter intersects with sustainability. So in our, whoa, in our book, <laughs> um, we actually have a model where we come up with these terms, respect, connect, detect, reject, and project, and reflect. They're basically parts of a wheel. And at the center is this idea of the mission, vision, and values of the company. Uh, reflect is how well that's connected to the, um, to the rest of the company, and then connecting is going out. I won't go through all the details. These are dimensions of, that are measurable of the ways in which your company, your organization, profit or nonprofit, connects sustainability to its projects. We actually have, uh, if you look at each of these dimensions, there's survey questions for each of these, and you can find out where you are, and each different pattern actually leads to different descriptions, and there's hundreds of them, but some examples are here. Um, for example, a greenwasher would be very high on connecting to the rest of the world, saying how great we are, how well we do in terms of um, meeting the Earth's needs and meeting social responsibility needs, but doesn't really do any of that. Okay, in fact, you could say that Volkswagen was working in that way when they produced that, that code to change the way their emission system worked. But each of these yields uh, some advice to, uh, to the organization as to how you might be able to fix being a, uh, a laggard or a shy optimist or a, uh, uh, an efficient bamboozler, my favorite. Okay, so if we go back to the big dig, if you think about that decision when they were purchasing these uh, brackets to mount the lights to the wall. Um, did they have long-term considerations in mind? Did they f really think about what happens to this bracket in the conditions that it's living in? Uh, salt uh, and uh, other corrosives, uh, the fact that electricity is nearby and that it's got vibration and so forth. Um, are they thinking about the long-term, right? So project managers, contract managers, anyone who's making these kinds of decisions should have that mission, vision, values, 
piece in mind, and they should be thinking about what this means past the handover of the project. So just to I'll close with this, we're trying to do something about this instead of just talking about it. Um, instead of the same old stuff, we actually have made proposals to the PMI regarding the sixth edition PMBOK. Um, I've got 16 or 18 proposals in on changes to the PMBOK guide um, so that these considerations are inside. They're intertwined. I don't want a separate, I don't want a new chapter. We have enough knowledge areas. So we're not asking for a new knowledge area. We want these interwoven in especially things like risk. So that in the risk section we add, have you thought about this and this? Um, it would be interesting for an example to have environmental uh, factors include the environment. So right now it doesn't really. <laughs> Just saying. So uh, some colleagues and I uh, around the world actually initiated this thing called the Sustainability Manifesto. Um, it's very simple. We could have written a complex manifesto, but again, with respect to art, we kept this exceedingly simple. And we have these basic, um, uh, just like the Agile. Anyone recognize the Agile Manifesto? So the same kind of language here. Both things are important. Benefits realization and metrics are both important, but we're asserting that benefits realization is more important. Value for many over value for money, long-term impact of projects over immediate results, managing economic, social, and environmental parameters over managing only the economic, and, and so forth. So that's, those are the assertions of the manifesto. We actually put a website together for this, and uh, it's basically got these words, a short video, uh, translations of the manifesto into a bunch of languages. And uh, it's simple. And we're just trying to promote the, promote the message. And this is not myself. This is a group of, uh, of us around the world. Um, these are some of the examples of the changes I've proposed to the PMBOK guide. So for example, a simple one, uh, under project governance, validating project and product requirements and the quality and sustainability of the results. Instead of just thinking about quality, let's add the word, add the thought about long term right into project governance. And there's others I won't bother reading to you. Those are formally submitted to PMI. They were also submitted in the fifth edition. We were told that they were um, deferred to the sixth editions. <laughs> deferred, not rejected. So we've resubmitted them, and I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm going to be persistent here. I, I want to really try to push for this. Uh, some others as well for your reference. And I think attendees will get slide copies. Yes? Okay. That's it. Um, I'm done. Thank you. Go eat. <laughs>